Um, thank you so much for coming here. I'm trying to find the right distance. Thank you so much for coming here. Um, uh, um, thank you so much for that nice introduction, Rick. I appreciate that. Um, uh, so I thought I would read a little bit from the stories, but I feel like I would be uh, remiss if I did not mention that, like, uh, Sherman Alexie is backstage, like a much better writer. I kind of feel like I kind of feel like like Michael Jordan is back there, and you came to watch B.J. Armstrong shoot around for a few minutes. Um, so I want to apologize for my existence. Um, so he writes a series of restaurant reviews where he's detailing the restaurant and the experience they have. But as you'll see, m more. Uh, um, emphasized really is the relationship he has with his mother. So I'll read a few reviews and then a kind of gauging your reaction will figure out when to stop. Um, <laughs> so be kind because I'm going to be listening acutely. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, the first one is called Sushi Nozawa. They go to a sushi restaurant. Okay. Last night mom took me to Sushi Nozawa near Matt's house. Except she didn't let Matt come with us, and I had to leave in the middle of my favorite show because Mom said we would be late for our reservation, and that I didn't know who she had to blow on to get the reservation. <laughs> <laughs> At the front of Sushi Nozawa is a mean woman. When I asked Mom why the woman is so angry, Mom said it's because she's Japanese and that it's cultural. <laughs> but the woman at school who serves lunch is also mean, but she is not Japanese. So maybe it's just serving food that makes people angry. <laughs> Sushi Nozawa does not have any menus, which mom said made it fancy. The sushi chef is very serious, and he stands behind a counter, and he serves the people whatever he wants, and he is also mean. <laughs> the first thing they brought us was a rolled up wet washcloth, which I unrolled and put on my lap, because mom always says that the first thing I have to do in a nice restaurant is put the napkin in my lap. But this napkin was hot and wet, and it made me feel like I peed my pants. <laughs> then mom got angry and asked me if I was stupid. <laughs> Mom said they had eggs, so I asked for two eggs, but when the mean woman brought them, they didn't look like eggs, they looked like dirty sponges, and I spit them out on the table in front of Mom, who slammed her hands on the table and made the plates rattle, and so I got scared and spit out more sponge on Mom's hands, and Mom yelled at me in a weird, whispery voice, saying that the only reason she took me to the restaurant is so that Dad would pay for it. <laughs> then I started crying, and little bits of the gross egg came out of my nose with snot, <laughs> and Mom started laughing in a nice way, and gave me a hug and told me to be more quiet. <laughs> the mean woman brought me and mom little plates of more gross fish bodies on rice. Then I asked mom to take off the fish part so I could eat the rice. Mom said, great, more for me, and ate my fish. I like rice because mom said it's like Japanese bread, but it has no crusts, which is good for me because I don't eat crusts anyway. I also like it when mom says, great, more for me, because it seems like that's her happiest expression. <laughs> When the woman brought the bill, mom smiled at her and said thank you, which was a lie, because mom hates when people bring her the bill. When mom and dad were married, mom would always pretend like she was going to pay, and when dad took the bill, which he always did, she said more lies, like, are you sure? Okay, wow, thanks honey. Now that dad doesn't eat with us anymore, maybe I should pretend to take the bill from mom and say a lie, like, oh really? Okay, thanks mom. <laughs> but I don't, because lies are but I don't, because lies are for adults who are sad in their lives. The mean, the mean woman took the bill back without saying thank you. I guess she is not sad, but she is definitely angry. And I understand why the people who work here are so angry. I guess it's like working at a gas station, but instead of cars, they have to fill up people. And people eat slowly and talk about their stupid lives at the table and make each other laugh. But when the waiters come by, the people at the table stop laughing and become quiet, like they don't want to let anyone else know about their great jokes. <laughs> and if the waiters talk about their own lives, they're not allowed to talk about how bad it is, only how good it is. Like, I'm doing great, how are you? And if they say something truthful, like, I'm doing terrible, I'm a waiter here, <laughs> they will probably get fired, and then they will be even worse. So it's probably always a good idea to talk about things happily. But sometimes that's impossible, and that's why I'm giving Sushi Nozawa 16 out of 2,000 stars. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. Okay, I'll just read one more, because um, he goes on a date with his mom, but you'll find out in the first paragraph. So, um, okay, so this, I'll read this last one. So, um, this is called The Whiskey Blue Bar at the W Hotel. <laughs> last night, mom took me to a bar. <laughs> called the Whiskey Blue Bar, which sounds like a fun blue place, but is actually a scary dark place. <laughs> Where drunk people wear lots of makeup and pretend like they're happy by talking loudly. 
Mom, mom had a date with a guy she called her widower friend. Widower means your wife died, and friend, when mom says it about a man, means someone rich who mom is trying to marry. <laughs> I never get to go on dates with mom, but mom wanted me to meet her widower friend because she wanted to show him what a good mother she can be to his two daughters, who no longer have a mother. The widower friend didn't know I was coming when he asked to meet mom at the Whiskey Blue Bar. And since I am not old enough to go to a bar, mom said that we had to pretend to be staying at the W Hotel. I told mom that I didn't want to lie to the hotel people, but mom said it was okay in this case because it was just a white lie, which I guess is a lie that white people are allowed to say without getting guilty. <laughs> Since mom wanted to show the man how good she was with children, I knew she would be nice to me the whole night. And when the man walked in, mom put her arm around me, which felt strange because she never does that, and I never noticed how cold and bony her hands are. <laughs> When we all sat down, the man said, didn't know you'd be taking your son here. And mom squeezed my shoulder again and said, I just can't bear to be away from this guy. I love kids. <laughs> I knew that mom was probably going to lie about liking children, but I thought she would probably think of a more creative way to do it. <laughs> the waitress came to our table and knelt down in a weird way like she wanted to show us her breasts. <laughs> she was wearing a short black skirt and was really beautiful, except up close. She said, <laughs> <laughs> she said, what can I get you folks tonight? Mom said that she wanted a strawberry mojito and asked the widower friend in a kind of babyish voice, is that totally girly of me? The widower friend smiled and blushed in a way that made me think he would have preferred to be actually on a date with a young girl instead of an old woman doing a baby voice. <laughs> then, the, then the widower ordered his drink in a really serious voice like it was important to get all the details right. Dry tank martini, twist of lemon, stir, don't bruise the gin. The waitress nodded very seriously, and I suddenly thought that it was strange to have a place that just makes drinks. Since they all only sell one thing, they have to take it very seriously, and I guess no one ever tells them that what they're doing is not an important job. <laughs> <laughs> He's nine, he doesn't know anything. Okay. <laughs> um, then the waitress showed me her breasts and asked, and what, can <laughs> and what can I get for you, little man? Mom asked the waitress to make me a Shirley Temple, which I didn't want because it's named after a dead. <laughs> Sorry, which I didn't want because it's named after a dead little girl named Shirley. <laughs> but I decided not to say anything. Then Mom said, "Mix it weak. He's driving tonight." And the three adults laughed, even though Mom's joke was a lie and also not funny. <laughs> When the drinks came, Mom finished hers kind of too quickly and ordered another one. The man sipped his slowly, which meant he probably didn't like Mom, and I just tried to fish the cherry out from the bottom of my drink because I was hungry. <laughs> the more Mom drank, the more she asked the widower's, the more she asked about the widower's wife. And I could tell that he didn't want to talk about his wife because he changed the subject. But mom said weird things like, did Debbie ever try Cedar sinai Hospital? Because my friend Joyce is an amazing endocrinologist over there. I think mom just wanted to show the man that she had a friend who was an important doctor, but because the wife had already died, it seemed like a weird thing to say. And the man seemed a little surprised. I thought that maybe he was trying not to cry, and then he kind of quietly said, we never tried Cedar sinai Normally, mom would be embarrassed for saying something so dumb, but because she was drunk, she didn't realize that she made the man upset. So instead of apologizing, mom said, I've been friends with Joyce since college. She's brilliant and actually very well read. The man just nodded. Mom said that she had to go freshen up, which meant she had to go poop, because, al <laughs> because alcohol makes mom poop. <laughs> and she left me alone with the guy. It was a little strange to be alone with him, because I think he didn't really like that I was on his date. And then I couldn't stop thinking about his dead wife either. And I just tried not to say anything about it, but I got so nervous that I said, I'm sorry that your wife died from cancer. <laughs> I knew it was the wrong thing to say, but I couldn't get it off my mind. And sometimes accidents happen even with talking. <laughs> he said, thanks. <clears throat> and then mom came back and I could tell that she must have pooped a lot because her face seemed relaxed. <laughs> when mom sat down, she said, ready for round three, Mr. Mister? Which meant she wanted to drink more alcohol with the man. But I could tell that the man just wanted to go home. I also wanted to go <laughs> I also wanted to go home, but I knew that mom wanted to stay, so I didn't say anything. But the man looked at his watch and said something like, I'd love to stay, but the girls are probably up worrying about me, which seems like something a normal parent would say, especially since his girls don't have a mom. This made me like the widower friend. 
The man walked us to our car and gave mom a hug, which mom kind of held to for a long time, even though the man tried to pull away. Yeah. And on the way home, I could tell that mom was upset with the date and that maybe she thought it was partly my fault. I could also tell that mom was drunk because she was driving all over the highway and we almost got into an accident with a man who rolled down his window and yelled at mom in Spanish. Then mom yelled something mean about Mexican people and I started to cry because the man kept yelling and it scared me, even though I couldn't understand the words he was saying. Sometimes the things that are the scariest are the ones you don't understand. And that's why I'm giving the Whiskey Blue Bar 136 out of 2,000 stars. <laughs> But I don't necessarily think the things that read well are always the things that are the best I've written. Okay, yes. Some things are better for a performance. Yes. Yes, absolutely. No, some, uh, there are things in the book that would absolutely not lend themselves to performance, but that I like. Um, and then conversely, there are things that, oh, I don't love as much, but they lend themselves to a performance because they're performative, they're monologue form, whatever it is. Like yeah. That. Okay, yeah. so let's talk about Brain first. Where did, where did it begin? Where did you think of this kid? Uh, the kid, I, was, I took my girlfriend to a fancy restaurant for an anniversary, and it was a very special occasion for us. But sitting at the next table was a family having like a a very unspecial occasion, a very casual dinner, and there was a little girl asking her mom, uh, mom, do I like hamachi, which is a kind of fish, and the mom said, oh, no, sweetie, you don't like hamachi, and then the girl said, do I like um, tamago, and the mom said, yeah, you like that one, that's eggs, and I just thought, oh, it was so strange to see this little kid thrust into this, you know, unusually fancy experience, and kind of still trying to navigate it, and, you know, trying to translate the Japanese, and doing all these things that... A kid, I just it felt just it's just it just felt a strange uh, um, combination of child and restaurant. And I thought initially, I just thought, oh, wouldn't it be funny to write restaurant reviews from a child's perspective who is, just has an impossible time navigating this adult world? Like they're just irrationally brought to these fancy places. And um, I started writing it, but then I realized, well, actually, the life of that child might be very strange. It might feel very lonely and alien because they don't feel like they belong in, in, in that world. And then I thought, well, what would be the circumstances that would bring them into that world? Well, maybe it's the product of a divorce and the mom is only bringing them because the dad... So it kind of spiraled into something that felt more rich and full of uh, real characters. I mean, it's really funny, but like the greatest funny things, it ends... It's pretty devastating, the ending. I don't want to give anything away. Oh, yeah, they both die. Yeah. yeah. No, no. I, mean, <laughs> I mean, you know... Giving a zero of 2,000 to the food poisoning. <laughs> yes, was, exactly, uh... exactly. Yes, they eat the blowfish. Um, yeah. <laughs> and then drive off a cliff. Totally unrelated to the blowfish. <laughs> well, they drive into the ocean and the blowfish eats them. That's right. Exactly. But, uh, yes. uh, so so did, you write, did you write it in order when you were doing this? Because it's, 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 it's like a novella. It's like a very short novella. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I kind of started to think of, like, what is the worst position I could put, put this kid in? And the situations get, like, increasingly horrible, like, to the point where, like, uh, one of, their, one of his, his best friend is in touch with a child molester who then agrees to meet them at the Fuddruckers. And it's dealt with, like, it, they don't, he doesn't realize, because you have this nine-year-old voice, so you can put him in the worst situations, and the reader knows what's happening, but the kid doesn't. So, like, there was a man in sweatpants getting arrested in the parking lot. And, <laughs> and so you realize he got saved from this thing. But so you're in his eyes, so you can, so I could say the worst things, like a parent abusing a kid, but it, for some reason it could come out as both real and also funny, because it's from the perspective of an optimistic kid. I mean, that, that's the brilliant thing you did. Uh, now people say to me with my young adult novel, how did you channel a teenage boy? And right. that's pretty easy. You just ask my wife, and she'll tell you, I, I channel that constantly. But, <laughs> exactly. Uh, so uh, try channeling an adult, please. Yes. <laughs> <That's exactly. laughs> could, could, could you be held more like the author of 24 books <laughs> yes, about exactly. adults? But exactly. uh, uh, how did you do a nine-year-old? And, and, and the thing is, he's smart. But he's also an idiot, like a nine-year-old would be. Yes, if your emotional life is at Arnold, mine is at this boy, nine. Yes, I, um, I, for some reason, I think that way. I'm really, and I mean this in a genuine way, like mystified why we all, don't like all cry in public more often. It seems to me like we should all just... Are you Indian? <laughs> Jewish. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> Similar trauma is better propaganda. Um, <laughs> um, and, uh, and so, like, my emotional inner life is stunted at nine, you know, where I think, like, 
oh, and then the woman put her breast in my face. I just feel like terrified of all those things that you walk into like a bar and it's loud and the people are shouting. And to me, it's like a terrifying place. But adults have socialized each other enough to like not only kind of tolerate it, but figure out that they should probably enjoy it because that's where you meet other adults and maybe you can sleep with them. To me, it's like, <laughs> that's like my hell. Um, and so like, I guess I may be stunted. Well, the, these couches work for that, so... What do you mean? You're, you're going to owe me $90. Yes, exactly, later. I know. That's a steal. I go, I, I go into therapy on New York prices. <laughs> How many therapists do you have? Just the seven, one, one per day. <laughs> yes. And I call them by their, by their day, not their names. It's too so, confusing. So they're like underwear. <laughs> yes, exactly. They're like underwear. Yes. Or Ghanaians, who are actually named after the day that they're born on. That's true. I... I... <laughs> Yes, I have two friends named Kabna. They were both born on Tuesday. That's true. Two friends? Yes, I have two Ghanaian okay, friends. Okay, so what, well, let's Tuesday. talk about how you grew up now. Where did you grow up, and what did, what did your parents do? I grew up in Ghana. and um, uh. No, um, I grew up in uh, Queens, and we moved to New Jersey. And uh, when I was younger, I would write jokes. I would make, like, little jokes to people in school. And I, never, I didn't have, like, normal social relationships, but I liked making jokes, and people said that, you're as funny as Steve Urkel. That was always the thing. You're as funny as Steve Urkel. I don't know if you've seen that show, but that's where the similarities ended. Um, <laughs> and so, like, but he was, like, the funny person in our lives at the time. And um, so that I loved being telling jokes and everything. I loved thinking about jokes. I loved words. Um, so my, you were making your own, though. You were, you were writing then. Yes, I was making my own jokes, and I was always thinking about jokes. And then when I turned, like, 11 or 12, I started watching, watching stand-up comedy, mm -hmm. and I thought it was... I loved it, and I would memorize the jokes, and I would write my own versions of those jokes. And in a oh, way... So who are you into, then? Well, at the... Now? Well, then? Then, um, so my favorite, favorite comedian when I was younger was this guy, Nick Swardson, who's from Minnesota. And he actually, then years later, he was in a movie, we were in a movie together called 30 Minutes or Less, and it was strange. It was like one of those, like, you meet your hero, and like, they're not always doing that funny bit that you liked when you were 12, um, you know, and you're disappointed. Um, <laughs> why isn't he still talking about the first Bush administration? And, um, and so um, I really liked him. And then uh, I memorized his entire it was routine and then I would do it as my own and then I got a Woody Allen CD when I was 15 I memorized his CD and again I did it as my own and I went to like an inner city New York high school so no one knew you know it was not, it was not like a Jewish school you know no one was exposed to Woody Allen so I was like um, Woody Allen has never been exposed to them either so. that's true yes that's true yeah. that's, that's yeah that's, <laughs> that's true um, <laughs> a good point. Um, and, uh, yeah, and then so um, I, I kind of got that into my bones and in my mind. And then, you know, uh, I started, then I found, and when I was like 24, I found McSweeney's and The New Yorker, and then I started writing pieces like that. And the great writers who write stuff like that, like kind of, you know, that short humor, uh, you know, say that if, if you come up with a piece that belongs in The New Yorker and you can't finish it within an hour, with the exception of like doing rewrites later, it doesn't work because there are conceptual pieces. So I have a piece in the New Yorker this coming Monday, and it's like a, kind of a satire on movie reviews. And it it took me like an hour to craft after I had the idea. Then you go back and spend some time rewriting it. But w when I found that style of writing, I fell in love with it because not only did was it funny and easy to read and good for my kind of attention span, which is somewhere between like lab rat and fruit fly. Like I. <laughs> You could also include some something else, maybe some social commentary, some stuff about race, which is something I'm interested in, which I talked about in those three pieces in kind of, you know, like kind of hidden ways, you know, or just, to, you know, you see that the mom is probably xenophobic and the kid is seeing it through his eyes and not realizing what, what it is. Um, and so you could do that in humor because it seems it's the perfect disguise. Yeah, and I mean... and. The brilliance, I mean, you bring in a couple of the other pieces where you have text, that the entire story is based on text. Right. Yeah. Which, which is a great way to bring in contemporary culture and technology, but then you, you bring in these... I mean, I think my favorite moment in the book is when you, there's uh, this, and it's not texting, there's an argument going on uh, before Vesuvius blows up. Oh, right, yeah. Right. And, and yeah. this guy's going off to see his mistress, <laughs> yeah. and the mistress is angry uh, about the wife, right? And so right, this, right. all this is going on, but the wife's name at Vesuvius is Debbie. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> yeah, now, yeah, yeah. where the hell did that come from? Well, you have like, a, I mean, I, I was thinking like Debius or something. Right. You have a very specific memory. Um, yes, that's true. Yeah, because the joke of like, see, I try to write about things that like I'm interested in. Yeah.
that's not a good time to abandon them. Yeah. <laughs> just, just sell them. Sell them. No. <laughs> They're terrible. Well, don't say that. I mean, I, the thing is, I have published terrible novels. This one's really terrible. Oh, I see, I see. Well, so in the Pantheon, it's not going to make such a difference. Yeah, so <laughs> it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's about these guys on the res who open up a disco. They, they see Saturday Night Fever, yeah. and they decide they need a disco on the res, and they open one. Can I publish that? No. I think it's great. Let me publish it. No. I'll do a, I'll do a kind of a your light own, edit. Your own imprint? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Jesse Eisenberg. Eisenberg Books? No, Eisenberg Book. Book. I'm going to put <laughs> I publish one book. <laughs> yes. And it's called Disco Inferno. Perfect. Perfect. That's great. And there's Dante-esque uh, allusions all over it. You, you can't keep tantalizing me with these great anecdotes <laughs> and then refuse to sell me the thing. <laughs> I'll put it in my will. You can publish it. You're a lot younger than I am. Thank so. you. Can I perform it as a kind of Dadaist performance art piece? <laughs> the hidden work of Sherman Alexie, <laughs> as done by Eisenberg. <laughs> from, from the prestigious press Eisenberg book. <laughs> it's just me naked and a disco ball. Uh, okay, yeah. <laughs> You'd have to be naked. Right, of course. But, 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 but on your ass cheeks would be tattooed young Travolta and old Travolta. Wait, would it be young Travolta with a question mark because you said young Travolta? Yeah. And, so it gives them the option to say no, it's not. Yes. <laughs> okay. And you'd have to work on your twerking. What's that? Turn into a screenplay. Yes, you know yes. what? I'll turn in the third slash 14th draft of that screenplay and we'll sell it. It's a callback. <laughs> Publish under a pen name, no. Um, so I'm wondering, Jesse, if you have a favorite review or a favorite line in the book that you're most proud of or enjoyed Ugh, the most. You know, they're like children. I can't. Uh, a Sophie's choice. Um, uh, uh, I'll, uh, King Solomon. I'll have to split a line into two. Um, no, um, no, I don't know. I like I like all the boys kind of you know, misreading situations and then they turn out to be profound. But my, yes, my favorite thing in the book is this, um, is this character named Harper and she's this angry 18-year-old girl. She's a college freshman and she's full of rage and she is writing a series of letters to her 11th grade guidance counselor, the only person she ever liked. And she's in college and she's writing a series of angry letters. And I think the funniest line in the book is she's like, she's trying to be thoughtful in one of her letters. She says, Dear Miss Rita, Sometimes life really sucks, but if you think about it another way, uh, it's not so bad. And then there's a footnote, and then the footnote says, you know? <laughs> it's just to me exactly how a girl like that would talk. Like, cause she, does, she does all these footnotes, and the footnotes are usually like explaining her long-winded ideas that she can't fully express in a sentence. But this one is just clarifying that her thought might be profound. And I love her voice, and I wish I could uh, read in her voice. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess that's my favorite line because it just I feel like sums up her character better than anything. And my favorite thing to do with, with, with a character is like be able to kind of sum up that character in the most uh, unassuming of sentences. You know, so it's not the time where the character says, I've always, you know, felt the Holocaust was really a parallel for my own life. You know, it's where a character just, you know, says, like, I don't like Fiji water because it's boxy and boxes scare me. You know, something like that, <laughs> where you can really tell a lot more about a person by the unassuming thing they utter. Can I ask, can I turn the question on you? I'm so curious, do you have a favorite thing? And uh, do you agree with my philosophy? <laughs> <laughs> Well, you've made me scared of Fiji water now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, no, that was a character. Uh, no, I was the, 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 no, I mean, that's, that's, you have, your, his book is filled with moments like that, with the footnoted you know, with Debbie, the, the wife <laughs> right, uh, right, at right. Pompeii. So it is the little eccentric details that are always the most interesting. Yeah, because as an actor, that's what I look for, too. I often get acting scripts, and I say, I don't want to play this character. There's not a real character there. And they say, what are you talking about? He's got a disease. You know, he's lost his mom. He's been in a car accident. And I say, but it's totally phony. It's a totally, like, kind of circumstantially created name. It's not a person. And then I read another thing, and I say, oh, well, my agent will say, well, no one, that's no one wants to do this. It's not a thing. But to me, as an actor, I see, no, this is a real individual. They have an unusual way of phrasing something. They don't like something that's specific that seems to conflict with this other thing that they do like, yeah. because that's, real, that's a real person. I mean, like little 
things I, I write down things I hear people say all the time when right, I'm traveling exactly. in airports. One of the recent ones was this woman was talking to her friend, and she said, well, I broke up with him because he wanted me to pay his phone bill. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Which, which I, I thought was so... Yeah, that's great. Yeah, and so I, I, I tweeted it, because uh, I don't know if I... <laughs> So much for keeping it for yourself. Yeah, so I was like, here, I'm not using it. Fuck this. But uh, uh, I, w- I was in a Rite Aid recently, like a, a pharmacy, and somebody coughed, but the other person there said, bless you, and then that person said, it was a cough. <laughs> <laughs> and nothing says, I'm a terrible person, like, it was a cough. <laughs> They deserve that disease. <laughs> Did you just wish TB on somebody? No, I just confirmed it. Okay. <laughs> yeah, no, they deserve the TB they have because you should say, oh, thanks a lot. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Instead of, I mean, yeah, it'll clarify. The impulse was so kind. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yes. Maybe they're agnostic and they were offended by saying, by being blessed. Oh. <laughs>